Hi, I'm Patty. I'm a jewelry designer here at Fire Mountain Gems and Beads, and today I'm going to be taking you through making these gorgeous sterling silver and fluorite earrings. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Uh, these earrings are actually fabricated from sheet metal, so we'll be learning a little bit about that. Um, let me show you some of the uh, items that we use to make this. So we start with some 28 gauge sheet metal, some fluorite beads, some 24 gauge sterling wire, some jump rings, and some sterling earring findings. Let me also show you the tools that we'll be using today. So starting here, we'll be using a permanent marker, some wax, a saw frame with a saw blade, a quench dish of water, a steel block, and a chasing hammer with a domed surface and a ball-peen surface, some sanding pads, a rag, our round nose pliers, our chain nose pliers, flush cutters, and bent chain nose pliers, the pickle pot and some copper tongs, some safety glasses, a firing block, a mini torch, some steel wool, a bench pin with a bench pin mount, a steel ruler, a metal file, and some tongs. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing we wanna do is measure out a two by one inch piece of the 28 gauge sterling silver sheet. And we'll do that using a metal ruler and a permanent marker. The permanent marker is gonna come right off the sheet metal, so it's not a problem. So the way that I measure out, that's already happens to be two inches this way, which is perfect. So we just need a one inch section this direction. So I'll use my metal ruler and measure out an inch several, um, in several places down the sheet metal. So we'll put a little dot there, move it toward about the middle, put a little dot there, move it toward the bottom half, and they don't need to be perfect just as long as they're an inch in. There we go. So then I'll take my metal ruler and just line up those dots. And I'm going to make a line right over them. That looks good. Okay. And I want it to go all the way to the edge. I'll get a little mark on my pad here, but that's okay. So we're going to be using the saw frame with a saw blade and a little bit of wax. So the first thing I'm going to do is wax up my blade. Use lots of wax, and that lubricates it so when it's going through the metal, it doesn't get hung up as easily. Set that aside. Then I'm gonna anchor the sheet metal on my bench pin with my non-dominant hand. I'm gonna really kind of press that down so it stays right down the center of this key in the bench pin, the keyhole. All right, then I'm gonna take my saw frame and add a pretty good angle. I'm going to just kind of pull it down the edge a little bit, really lightly. And the key to doing this well is to use very little pressure at first. The harder that you push, um, the more it's gonna get hung up. So you're really having a nice relaxed grip on the blade. And you just saw, you just stay right on that line. And there we have our two by one inch piece of sheet. And then I'm gonna move, move back. All right, now that we've got our one by two inch section of sheet metal cut, it's time to anneal it. And annealing is a process where you heat the metal to soften it up before you hammer it and it, um, it's a much easier to hammer that way. So I'm gonna move some things around here. Um, whenever you're gonna be using a torch, which is how we anneal, you move everything out of the way, anything that could possibly 
melt, catch fire. You don't want it anywhere near your torch. So I'm going to move all of these plier handles, this little plastic tray just for a moment here, and then we're good. So we use a firing block. I'm going to set that here. And we've set everything aside so there's nothing that could melt or catch fire. That's really important when you're using a torch. We have our quench dish right nearby. That's what we're going to put our piece in to cool it down immediately. You want to have some tongs to pick up your piece right nearby. I'm going to, this has a rubber handle, so I'm going to move that off. Okay, so really nice, clean, clear surface. So we'll put our metal on. And before I even pick up my torch, I'm going to put on some safety goggles. Make sure and have safety goggles that really fit to your face um, so no little spark could possibly fly up into your eyes. Um, then I'll take my mini torch. And to start the torch, you kind of pull down on this handle. Again, check your area and make sure that everything's safe and ready. And then you can start the torch with the starter and then push in the little side button to get a continuous flame. Okay, so I'm just running my torch back and forth over the piece. Don't keep it in one place too long. And we're going to do it until the piece glows a bit. So I'll show you what that's going to look like. And you can see that there's some fire scale forming on the metal. And that's fine. We're going to remove that afterward. Just nice, even flame, not staying in one place. And this will evenly anneal the metal so it'll be the same softness all the way through. You can use an oxygen acetylene torch to do this, or if you don't have that, you can use a little mini butane torch like I'm using here. Uh, if you're firing something much larger, you probably want the oxygen acetylene or maybe a propane torch. I don't know if you can see there, but the, the tip of the flame, I'm keeping off of the piece. Just to kind of above it. And there we go. You can see it's almost looking kind of coppery. It's starting to glow hot. And it'll actually turn an orangish red when it's ready. You don't want to fire it any further than that because you can actually melt your silver. And I want it to, it's not all going to glow at the same time in the same place because it's going to glow where the flame is. So I just want to make sure all of it glows the same before I stop. That's properly annealed. So then I'm just going to hit the button on my torch to turn that off and make sure and put it in a place over here where it's safe. And then I can take my goggles off. Okay, so you can see that the piece is really fire scaled now. I'm going to put that right in the quench dish. And when you put it in the quench dish, especially with something as thin as this, it's immediately cool. You can actually pick it up. The fire block, however, the center there will be kind of warm, so I'm not going to touch that. I'm just going to set it aside somewhere safe. Okay. So now that we've got our piece annealed, we need to do something called pickling it. So we've got our pickling pot here and pickle is just a word for the dry acid compound that we use to remove the fire scale when it's mixed with water like this. And then you add a little heat. You put your crock pot here on low. So with my safety goggles on, to make sure none of that acid goes up into my eyes. We don't want an accidental splash. We'll use some co copper tongs here and grab the piece with the copper tongs. The copper um, works well with the Sparex. It doesn't contaminate it. And then we'll just open the lid and drop that piece in there. 
That will sit there um, for just two or three minutes. It'll remove the fire scale. We'll take that back out and then we can hammer. Okay, so the fire scale now has been eaten away by the Sparex in our pickle pot. We can go ahead and remove that piece. We'll rinse it and then we'll dry it off. Um, the Sparex is not super um, dangerous to your skin. If you get a little bit on your skin, just rinse it off. It's okay. It's not going to eat at your skin, but you don't want to leave it on there and you definitely don't want it in your eyes. So I do have my goggles on still. So I've got my piece and you can see the fire scale is off. See how it's kind of white now. I'm going to just drop that in my quench dish to rinse it off and then move my pickle pot away here. and just dry it off. So you can see that the black scale is gone now and it's replaced with kind of a white coating which is gonna just pound right off when we hammer our piece. I'm not even gonna worry about um, removing that because as we hammer the piece, it'll just dissipate. It's nice and dry. We want, you want everything to be nice and dry before you put it on the steel block because you don't want any moisture on the steel because um, that promotes rust. Okay, set that aside for now. And then I'm going to bring in my steel block and my hammer. So we'll go ahead and put that piece on the steel block. And we're going to be forming this kind of curved, um, the curve in the metal, see how it curves around? And as we hammer it, it'll naturally curve that way. I'll show you the way that we're going to hammer it. So I'm gonna start in the middle here and I'm using the ball surface of the hammer only. I don't actually need the domed surface for this project. So to create that natural curve and the beautiful hammered texture, I'm using the ball peen surface of the hammer and I'm just going to kind of anchor the piece down with kind of the tips of my fingers like this. It's better not to anchor it this way because then it's just more, much more likely you're going to hammer your finger. So this is a little bit better. So we're just going to go straight down the middle. and start it that way. Just do a nice little random pattern straight down the middle. I'm not using too much pressure, kind of a medium pressure. And then I'll just have to readjust my grip as I go. But you can see already how the, the metal is starting to curve a bit. That's what you want. And I'm going to keep going until I have the whole center pretty much covered with hammer marks. And you can adjust your grip. Sometimes it's easier to kind of pull some of it off and do it this way. maybe flip it around and do the other side that way. Gives you a little more control. Okay, so now I'm going to, you can see the, how this, the center is kind of curving, but the sides are still very straight because those haven't been hammered. I'm gonna grab one side and put the other side just on the block and I'm gonna hammer from the center out to the edges of the sides. And adjust your grip as you need, whatever's most comfortable in work.
So you may come to a point where you feel like it's not curving enough and the metal is a bit work hardened and you, we would like it to be more malleable. If you come to that point and feel like you need to, go ahead and anneal the piece again, just like we did, put it in the pickle and then keep hammering. But I'm feeling like it's actually okay um, the way that it is right now. So I'm just gonna continue my hammering. And I'm really focusing kind of on the center before I do the edge that causes that natural curve. Now I'm getting out to just the edge bit. I wanna make sure that all of the edge gets hammered for a really nice even texture. Now I can really see the places that have been hammered because this white um, film that's kind of left after we pickled the piece is evident in all the little places where it hasn't been hammered. So I can use that as a guide to where I still need to hammer. So it's actually kind of a useful thing to leave that white film there. And you don't have to get every um, square millimeter, but get as much as you can. Okay. So this side is really nicely curved. It's getting really nicely finished. I'm gonna do just, just a little bit more on this side. I'm feeling like that's really good. So now I'll flip the piece around and I'll do the same thing from the center out on this side. So here you see I've got both sides finished, just the same way. We flip it up and you can see this natural curve that happened as we were hammering. The next thing we need to do is finish off the corners, they're really sharp right now, and the edge that we cut is really sharp. So I'm gonna use a file to clean those up and then some sanding pads. So we'll start with a file and I'm just gonna file the corner and I do it in one direction. So I have a really good grip on the piece and then I'm pulling the file or I'm pushing the file. Don't go back and forth because that way you um, end up maybe removing too much metal. If you remove too much metal, you can't get it back. But if you go slowly and in one direction, you have more control and you're just really wanting to round it out. I'm going, kind of going in an arc around the corner And then I'll kind of test it with my finger and see how sharp it is. And then I'll do some more if I need to. But the temptation is to file like this back and forth and back and forth. And it's actually never the best way to file when you're working with jewelry. Just because it's so um, small and such fine detail, you want to really get it right. So a little more control and a little... Um, a little slowness is good. That feels really good. So I'll do the other three corners the same way. And also the edge um, that I cut is a little sharp too. So I'm just going to plane it a little bit like this. Just a little bit, doesn't need a whole lot. And I'm just kind of going at different angles to make sure I get all the pieces of the edge. Okay, and then we'll do the other three corners the way we did the first corner. And here I have one where all of the corners have been filed down and the edge has been filed down. Then we just take a sanding pad and just run the sanding pad over the edges at different angles on all the corners. And you just wanna make sure that it's nice and smooth. It feels good to the touch, that it won't abrade your skin anywhere. Doesn't take a whole lot. But always finger test it. Run your finger over all the edges in different ways and just make sure that it feels really good.
and it does. Okay, now that we've finished the sheet metal portion of the piece and made this beautiful sterling silver base with that hammered texture, we'll go ahead and wire on the beads here, these gorgeous fluorites, I love those. So I'm just gonna take a length of the 24 gauge wire And we'll cut that with the flush cutters. Better to cut a little bit too much than not quite have enough. And then I'm gonna choose five of the fluorite hearts here. Okay. So before I actually wire on those beads, I wanna take the sheet metal and just take a polishing cloth and I'm just gonna rub that across the sheet metal just to make sure it's nice and shiny and pretty. That looks great. Let me flip it over. That looks much nicer. You can see a little of the scale still was on there. That looks really pretty. Okay, so I'm gonna take my sterling wire and in the center, I'm gonna use my chain nose pliers and I'm just going to bend it parallel, just like that. Then I'll take my sheet metal piece and I'll center that bend at the bottom there. And I can adjust that a little bit in a second just so it's kind of roughly in the center. Now I'm gonna go ahead and thread on the heart beads from the bottom to the top. And just do them in whatever order. Seems like it'll be pretty. Okay, so I've got all five of my hearts on there. I'm just going to let them drop to the bottom of that bend. Kind of pushing them to the center of the sheet metal. Then I've got my two wire tails here coming up. I'm going to um, put those together and using my round nose pliers, maybe about a third of an inch up, I'm going to make a bend in both wires. And then I'm going to wrap both wires around the round nose pliers. Take out the top barrel, put in the bottom barrel. Make sure I'm getting it through both of those wires. So we make kind of a double loop. And then push those wire tails the rest of the way around. Okay, so once you hit the bottom of the sheet metal, you can stop and in the back, you wanna cut those tails off. Then just use your chain nose pliers to tuck in those tails to make sure that there's nothing sharp on the piece. And you can see it's a bit of a messy wrap. That's okay, that's the look that we wanted. And then just center the wire on the top and the bottom. Isn't that pretty? I love the reflection of the hearts on the sides of the sterling silver. It's just gorgeous. Okay, so now we're just gonna grab a jump ring. We've got these little three millimeter jump rings and an ear wire to finish that off. So just pick up your jump ring, put it in your Bent chain nose pliers is how I like to do it. And position it so the opening is right near the tip of those bent chain nose pliers. Then with your chain nose, you can open that sideways. And it's so little, you have to be really careful in your positioning. So you have purchase on it so you can hold it, but you have a nice opening. You're gonna put that double loop through the jump ring and then you're gonna put your ear wire through the jump ring. Make sure that you orient the ear wire so it is facing forward when you put that earring in. 
Grab your chain nose pliers and just close that back up. You want to rack it back and forth a little bit so you got a nice tight connection. And there you have your beautiful fabricated sterling silver and fluorite earring. Thank you so much for being with us here today. I hope you enjoyed this project. We have so many beautiful start to finish projects in our gallery. Make sure and check out our website for those. And again, don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you next time.